In this lesson, we will take a closer look at what our visual perception system can and cannot do. We take our ability to see our environment for granted and feel that we get a complete picture of what is around us. But we are not aware of everything that happens between our eye and our brain and its influence for what we can actually perceive. Let's start with a simple memorization game. Here you will briefly see numbers on the screen. Try to spot them, remember them and click them in ascending sequence. It is quite difficult, right? Here you see my own pathetic attempts. As the primatologist Tetsuro Matsuzawa has found out, chimpanzees are actually very good at this task, much better than humans. They have no problem spotting the symbols and recalling their locations. Through games like the previous one, we are quickly confronted with the limits of our visual perception and memory system. And there are many similar examples of such limits. Here's another one. Try to find out what changes between the two frames. I'm sure you can find out. Here's a hint. But most likely you will not immediately see it. This phenomenon is called change blindness. It simply means that we cannot hold a complete image in our memory of what is in front of us, and this prevents us from detecting change in the environment. Detecting change is a task that requires our attention, and we have to make a conscious effort to find it. This has many surprising implications. Please watch this video. What these examples tell us is that we cannot take the act of seeing for granted. As the philosopher Alva Neu says, perception is not something that just happens to us, it's something that we have to do actively. He proposes that we should think about our perceptual system not as a camera that re records everything instantaneously. Um, our sense of touch is a much better model for perception. We tap and probe our environment and based on the information that we get, our brain constructs a coherent image, mostly without us noticing. These processes have been famously studied by the Soviet scientist Alfred Jarbus in the 1960s. He invented the method of eye tracking. He showed this painting to his subjects and asked them questions about it. As his subjects were trying to answer his questions, he recorded the movement of their eyes through a complex optical mechanism. This is what happens when subjects explore the painting freely. They mostly devote their attention to the faces of the people that are depicted in the image. Unless Jabus asked his participants whether they think the family depicted is rich or poor, suddenly the objects in the room become more important. Or the question is how old the people in the picture are. Now the faces are the main focus again. This is the result of the question, what was the family doing prior to the visitor's arrival? And finally the question, how long has the visitor been away? Suddenly the relationships between the faces and their expressions become the main interest. The reason for this is the way our eye is constructed. We have a very high resolution in the center of our attention but a very low resolution at the periphery. So when we think we see a scene, 
we actually see a series of small details that we piece together in our brain. To make the long story short, everything we see is constructed rather than recorded. And this has many interesting implications for visualization. Because of the way this construction takes place in our brain, we sometimes fall prey to optical illusions. We might see movement where there is none. In this example, you will notice that the movement only occurs in the periphery of your focus point. That's exactly where our brain is most busy filling in the blanks. Many different parameters are involved in this construction. The frequency of bright and dark spots, for example, helps us to interpret geometry. In this cafe wall illusion, we would usually not believe that the lines are in fact parallel, but that can be easily tested. Also, our sense of perspective is important. Because we interpret the cues of depth differently, we do not notice that both table surfaces have the exact same size and shape as they are depicted in this image. Despite all of these shortcomings, our perceptual system is really good at seeing some other things. This is a phenomenon that is often called pre-attentive perception. You will have no problems finding the red dot in this image. In fact, you will recognize it faster than you can devote your attention to it and move your eyeballs, hence the designation of pre-attentiveness. In the next example, it gets a little bit harder, since here the colors are the same, but it will still work. To some extent, we can recognize also shapes pre-attentively. In the last example, we combine both shape and color, and as a result, pre-attentive perception no longer works. The implications for visualization are clear. If you want to support the discovery of patterns in your data, the visual language is really important. Psychologists and cognitive scientists have discovered many different properties that we can identify effortlessly. I recommend you reading Christopher Healy's paper uh, to get an overview of those different phenomena and theories for their explanation. As a visualization designer, we have to make many choices. If we have only two categories of data, do we encode them by shape or do we introduce color? If we are consistent with our choices and don't send mixed messages, we can greatly support pattern recognition. In this case, for example, by adding color as a distinctive feature that makes it easier to recognize the different shape of our symbols. So this is what our previous discussion of visual variables is all about. It's all about our ability to see differences in data. Here we see three different visual languages that encode the same data set. We have no difficulties comparing the bars in terms of the length if they start at the same baseline. It gets a little bit harder to compare the area of the circles and it's even harder if we have to compare the shades of color. Now all of these visual languages are important and are appropriate in some contexts. For example, I would not advise you to use bar charts over a map of the United States to show election results in each state. But it means we have to think hard about which languages we want to use and what are the implications of that choice. In everyday representations of data, we are often tricked by details. If you look at the two curves in the upper left corner, you will have the impression that they converge. In fact, the distance 
stays exactly the same. As visualization designers, we have to be very careful about those things.